to spend 10 minutes um, trying to give you an understanding of how those technology trends are going to affect you, the IT worker. Um, and there's a lot of things there that are absolutely relevant for people who are working in the area of IT. Um, we obviously talk to hundreds and hundreds of companies every day uh, about jobs. We talk to thousands and thousands of candidates every month about how to find a job. And with that in mind, um, I just want to talk to you about firstly some of the jobs of the future. And these aren't even jobs of the future anymore. Some of these are right now data analysts, IT security consultants. But what is interesting about a lot of jobs, I heard the head of innovation for Blackstone Smith Line talking about personalized medicine consultants and talking about these pills, digital pills you can now ingest in your body and will start to tell you and regulate and tell you about how the pills are working for you. So there's fascinating things happening. But the key thing here in the technology field is all of these future jobs seem to have a whole link with technology. Technology is absolutely central to so many of the jobs of the future. So guess what? Technology is a great place to be. Um, it's also moving very fast. I'm sure you're all familiar with Moore's Law, but when we talked about things moving year to year, one year, then being uh, then twice as fast and three times as fast and four times as fast and after 30 years being 30 times as fast. As we know from Moore's law, it's exponential. So after 30 years, it won't be 30 times as fast, it'll be about a billion times as fast. So things are going to move very, very quickly. So I expect to have my own flying car within 10 years. Okay? Um, so what's the change in the IT role? Well, this is the old IT role, and we know this has changed. But interestingly, while it has changed and technology is very cool now, actually the brand of technology probably still isn't cool in a lot of organizations. And a lot of people still see technology as a room in the basement in the corner where somebody just answers your phone and tells you to turn the, turn the computer on and off again. Okay? It's moved on a lot from there, but the brand hasn't. But let me tell you, here's some good news about how it is going to move on. Because one, we talk about digital natives. Anyone under 10 years old has never not known a mobile phone, has never not known the internet. So that's great. Right? So it, it means that everybody of the future is going to expect things to work. And that actually caused me a bit of embarrassment in my last presentation because I actually brought my laptop with me and I plugged it in from the night before and up came this, which is my new desktop wallpaper, which my six-year-old uh, decided to put on the machine, which just makes somebody think something about me which may not be true. But it just shows you that six, eight, ten-year-olds, um, they're able to use technology because it just works for them because they've always been used to it. But interestingly, the challenge we're going to have is most people now have technology in the pocket. As Adrian said, we're moving to laptops, we're moving to mobile. And the challenge I've heard recently is someone said, how can I be such a master of the universe Saturday and Sunday and such a dweeb Monday to Friday? How is it possible that I can find out who sat beside me in primary school, second grade, in about 10 seconds on my own computer, and then I go into work and I can't even find out who my best customer is? So what's going on there? So their view is, everything they have at home works and it works really, really quickly, and then they come into work, and they haven't logged off the computer because it takes 10 minutes to log on again. They have to go through all these firewalls and security passwords, and it just doesn't work very well. And that's going to have to change, because the generation where everything works at home, including their iPoddy, they're not going to be ready for things not working, which is why people are having huge challenges with bringing their own device to work, and whether an iPhone, an iPhone, like a laptop is now a work laptop or a home laptop. And I was at a conference recently where a guy was talking brilliantly about how he used his iPad for everything, work and play, but he realized it had problems because people used to kind of ask him to authorize expenses, but his kid had had angry birds in the back and they go, will you authorize an expense to Vegas? Yeah, absolutely, anything to get this off the screen so we can get back to angry birds. So there is a challenge when you have a computer which can do everything home and work. So you're going to have people who are going to get very frustrated. But the good news is everybody is now a technologist. They want to talk technology. So if you're in the technology industry, they want to talk to you because everybody feels they know a little bit more about it than they did before. So that, that's great. There's other things that, that are positive as well. The CEO wants to talk technology because they believe the next game changer of the organization is going to be something to do with technology. The problem is, they don't know what it is, but they expect the CTO or the CIO to tell them what it is. Because that's becoming the game changer for most people where they go from being a good company to being a great company. So in the past, where only 23% of CTOs um, reported to the uh, CEO, that's going to have to improve because they're going to embrace this more. The challenge is, as McKinsey have highlighted when they interviewed lots of CEOs, that when they do talk to them and say, what's the problem with the CTO? They say, the problem is, they talk to me about IT costs and project implementation time scales, but what we want them to talk about is technology trends. I'm sure you'll get a different answer if you speak to CTOs about it, but that's what the CEOs are saying. So while they want somebody who is deep, technical, a good project manager, someone who can get it done, what they're now asking for is the following. They want someone who's opinionated, someone who's a commercial, someone who's a negotiator, essentially someone who can sell internally. And that's a very different skill set to what it was before. 
But if you're going to actually tell a whole board in your organization that they're going to have to invest a huge amount of technology, otherwise your company's going to go bust, you better be able to sell that and influence people internally in the organization. So why is the skills disconnect? Well, Tech Target did a survey where they asked people what the main skills they were getting were. And you see it's their compliance, project management, legal. But then they said, they're the skills they're being asked to develop. But then they said, well, how important are each of these skills? And the most important ones aren't even up there. So these are what IT executives and managers think are most important. People skills, business management skills. They're the ones they want, and they're the most important to them, but they're not getting them. So it's this horrible world, soft skills. You know, IT managers and senior managers need soft skills. But the fact is that this is absolutely changing. Forfus will be producing a report, part of the expert skills group, talking about the challenge we have for IT skills in the future. And they talk at the graduate level how all the universities are changing, that they don't want people to be deep technical specialists. So technology is changing way too quickly. They want what they call the T-shaped graph. They need to have some, the T, which is some deep knowledge, but the T that's along the top is they need to have broad interdisciplinary skills because they're going to be business people more than technologists. And this is a very interesting one. We talk to a lot of people who don't work in technology companies, and you ask them a simple question. They work in IT, and you say, where do you work? And the answer is, I work in IT. They don't say I work for KPMG, they don't say I work for Musgrave, they don't say I work for Tesco, they work in IT. So that's a challenge, because they're more wedded to their functional skill set than they are the company they work for. But if you have a CTO or a senior technical person in an organization, you need to understand the business objectives of the organization if you're going to help implement the technology to bring it to the next level. Where there is still a disconnect where technology is, well, they fix things when they're broken and the business make the business decisions. That can't happen anymore. The reason the biggest entrepreneurs around Mark Zuckerberg, Steve Jobs, they're technologists, designers first, they're business people second. So it's a massive shift of how it's going to work. Steve Elop from um, Nokia, and maybe you mentioned um, Nokia earlier, highlighted this very clearly when he talked about Nokia in 2011. He said, how is it possible that 2011, Nokia has nothing similar to the iPhone, despite the fact the iPhone came around in 2007? Four years, he said, it's absolutely damning. And his view was, he said, we were too proud to copy. We felt we had to innovate. So they spent four years trying to think of something better. Look at Google and Android, within six months, they just went, this is a brilliant product. We can't create something better, so we're going to copy it and then make it better down the line. We're just going to hang on to their coattails. And this is a challenge. What Nokia needed were business savvy technologists who maybe realized that maybe Steve Jobs had just created something that was perfect at the time and they weren't going to create anything better and they just needed to stay in the game. And they spent four years and when 10 years ago in this room, 90% of people were probably be sitting there with a Nokia phone. I'm not going to embarrass anyone by asking them if they still have one. I'm sure there's someone. And then big data recruitment. How does this focus on recruitment? Because uh, Adrian mentioned about big data. Well, the first thing I say is if you're a technologist, I've told you you've got to sell internally. So the story I always talk about big data, because a lot of people don't get it, is a story about a, 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 the shop in the States called Target, where a guy came into the store really, really angry uh, because his 16 year old daughter had been sent a newsletter about pregnancy clothes. And he goes, How dare you? This is a disgrace. So they went home and apologized, went back to their data guys and said, Why is she receiving this? And they looked at it and said, well, she's moved from scented to unscented shampoo, she started to buy certain flaxiloid products, and she's actually getting this B vitamin complex that she started to buy. So we actually work out her algorithm, there's about an 89% chance she's pregnant. So Stover said, fair enough. So he rang the uh, father. Before he could, the father, he could say anything to apologize, the father said, actually, I've just found out she is pregnant. <laughs> so the fact is, the store knew before her own father knew she was pregnant. Now that's how you sell big data in your organization. Tell facts, tell stories, tell, tell the story first. But that's what's interesting. I mean, it is everywhere. And in, in organizations where people recruit, LinkedIn is now over 200 million members. But here, but data itself isn't enough. A key stat around LinkedIn is people are seven times more likely to look at your profile if you can picture. Seven times. So if you're looking to recruit staff, they're probably going to want to look at your organization, your company, and see who you are. If you're looking for a job, they're much more likely to look at you if you've got a picture than if you don't. There's also something about electronic tattoos that a um, uh, professor in Harvard has been talking about. We might look at these tattoos and go, these are huge, massive mistakes that you might have thought were a great idea at the time. But this very links to, uh, to Adrian's presentation that everybody's going to be looking for jobs sometime in the future. And the contention from this professor in Harvard is that everything that we put online is there forever. Forever. So 
The, ch the challenge is we all now are electronically tagged because when you add LinkedIn and Facebook and Google, and then you add in the scary things like GPS, security cameras, facial recognition, it's going to be a long time before you scrub any of that data off. So what was the purview of the rich and famous and heads of state where they got covered every moment of every day on camera? That's now happening to every single person in the room. And that is interesting because that's going to create some challenges. So when you think about how that's going to work, well, you might not think it's a big idea, but in five years' time, maybe less, you go into a bar, you click somebody's face, and you download all the records about that person before you even decide you want to speak to them. Because the information is there. What they're doing at the moment is collating it. And if you don't believe this, Here's a company called Face.com, and they have 18 billion pictures bought that are facial recognition pictures. There's only 7 billion people in the world, they have 18 billion. But if you look at the website, you may not find them because they were bought last year by Facebook. So don't believe for a second Facebook isn't going to be doing anything with all this information, 18 billion pictures. So Facefeels.com is another site, nothing to do with Facebook. They actually now will download your picture when you come into the store, put it into the social media database, actually find out you're a woman, you like black dresses, and someone will come up to you, look, we've got five black dresses here, would you be interested in any of them? So how are they going to do that for recruitment? How are they going to target you? Well, they're going to look at all the things in your profile, and absolutely, as Aiken says, what's ethical and what's not is absolutely unknown at the moment. And there's a lot of cases going on at the moment, but guess what? It won't stop people doing this anyway, and just not saying anything. There's also a company called Bullhorn Reach, which have got technology now which works out if you're actually looking to leave your job. So they look at an algorithm around are you connecting with recruiters, are you updating your bio, are you starting to follow certain organizations that are similar to your organization, are you maybe starting to do presentations or put slides up on SlideShare online, and they're actually giving a calculation about whether you're looking for a job or not. And remember, this is the basics of big data. What's it going to be like in three, four, or five years' time when they can actually track a lot more? So the question is not what will, or sorry, it is the question what will, not what does your electronic or digital profile say about you. So it's not about now, it's about all the information that they're gathering you now, what in 10 years will they be able to tell about you. And you do want to be different, unless you're a great philosopher once said, Marge, I'm not popular enough to be different. Well, you do have to be different for your next job, for your next opportunity, but you do need to make sure it's the right difference. It's not the reason people won't want you. And uh, for anyone, I'll be going on tonight to play with a graph search just to see what it does say about people, because I think that's very interesting. So takeaways, the positives. First thing, technology is now everywhere. The young generation are digital natives. Every CEO wants technology to be the game changer. So that is great if you're in this industry, because every other job seems to have a tech element. Great. Number two, to go forward in your organization, to get promoted, to get to the next level, you're going to need to build a new skill set around influencing, around revenue generation, around commercial, if that's what you want to do, because they, these people, all companies are crying out from the graduate up for these sorts of people. And then finally, don't trip yourself up. So as Adrian said, and I'm saying again, around the data, just be careful about what you're putting online. Thank you very much.